what I'm going to try to do tonight is consistent with the theme of uh, local character and global vision. I want to try to convey what I think are some real issues with respect to the scientific ethos, the scientific community, and the role that I believe citizens of all flavors can be playing and the role that I think scientists of all flavors can be playing. So let's go ahead and get started then on this story. And the story starts with a few characters. And the idea here is that if you go back in history, you find that uh, those people that we read about in our elementary school books about uh, leading scientific uh, development, in many cases were independently wealthy or were patronized. Of course, Leonardo da Vinci uh, was, uh, had patronage from none other than the Borgias and the Medicis. Uh, and, and incidentally, Walter Isaacson's recent biography of him is wonderful if you get a chance to read it. The fellow in the middle. Anybody recognize the fellow in the middle? Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday developed many of the principles around electricity and electromagnetism, which are now part of our everyday life, whether it's your cell phone or your car, for that matter. And Michael Faraday was uh, basically the protege of Humphrey Davy, uh, another famous British scientist. You get into a slightly different mode with the woman on the right, who is, of course, Marie Curie, who wasn't uh, under patronage so much, but she worked at the University of Paris when she did so much of her work, which got her the first Nobel Prize for a woman, I would add. So the, she was working in a university environment that was different from what we have today, similarly with George Washington Carver, who did so much work for agriculture and botany uh, at what is now the Tuskegee Institute. But he was also benefiting from the patronage, if you will, of the university structure as it existed then. And the consequence of this was that back in the 19th century, science tended not to be mainstream. It was quirky. It was the kind of thing that was interesting, a little bit of wizardry maybe. In fact, there's a great quote from a Canadian author who says the Victorian era was perhaps the last point in Western history when magic and science were allowed to coexist, Jonathan Oxier. And it, it puts the context kind of nicely for where we are right now. And that's really what the 19th century uh, and early 20th century scientific domain were all about. A little bit of magic, a little bit of wonder, not necessarily a whole lot of value to society yet. So as a consequence, scientists built ivory towers. Scientists tend to think we are the deep thinkers. We're the ones who have all of the interesting ideas. Let's go work in our little laboratory or in our university setting, and we don't really care what the rest of the world thinks. In fact, this persisted for quite a while, and I'm reminded of a colleague I worked with when I was doing my postdoctoral work up in the state of Maine, uh, and this fellow, who will remain nameless, was a wonderful, world-renowned chemical oceanographer. And he was studying the cycling of nitrogen in the marine environment, how it got in the sediments, how denitrification occurred, really seemingly esoteric stuff. And uh, this was in the wonderful little town of Booth Bay Harbor, excuse me, Booth Bay Habba, Maine. And he was giving a talk one day to the local Civitan or Lions Club, I can't remember which, and, and he was talking about nitrogen cycling. And it was actually a very good talk for, for the, the tone of the audience and what they were interested in learning about. And at the end, one of the folks in the audience raised their hand and said, well, why do you study this stuff? And his answer was, you don't ask a concert pianist why they play the piano. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, that was probably 35, 40 years ago. There is not a scientist in the world right now who could give that answer or be allowed to give that answer. But that was the era when ivory towers were built and science for science sake was highly respected. In fact, if you look at the way science was perceived, even up through the 50s, it was viewed as something of a luxury. And what you're seeing here is a reprint from the highly respected journal Science of an uh, editorial that was published in the New York Times. Uh, this is 1967 now. And they're referring to this concept of building a uh, 200 billion electron volt accelerator, basically an atom smasher. 
And their comment is that it's a distortion of the national priorities to commit many millions now to this interesting, but, should say, but unnecessary scientific inquiry. Luxury. It's a luxury. Science is a luxury. So here we are in a situation where science was tinkering to a large degree in the 19th century, then became this seemingly esoteric luxury around which ivory towers were built. And then something interesting happened, and I would attribute a lot of what happened to this fellow, Van Ever Bush. So it was late 1945, and the president, uh, sorry, it was actually 1944 because it was uh, FDR. FDR realized we were about to win the war, and he said, we've done all of this stuff, whether it's the atomic bomb or submarines that are capable of detecting sounds in the sea, What's going to happen to all of this science that we've developed in engineering after the war? So he called, and that was a really prescient concept on the part of FDR, and he called on this guy who was really his, his science advisor, a professor of physics named Van Everbush, and he said, figure out what we're going to do. And Van Everbush, uh, with a committee of uh, five or six other folks, within seven months, Think about that. I can't remember the last time the federal government issued a strategic document within seven months. But within seven months, published something called Science, the Endless Frontier. And in that publication, they said, you know, this scientific stuff is really important for a wide range of applications, health, economics, national security, many, many other applications. We really need to invest in this as a federal government. It's a public good. It's no longer the domain of just the quirky and interested scientists. We need to invest in this, and we need to establish standards by which we will determine what research should be done. Standards like, for example, peer review. So Van Ever Bush established a context for science as we know it today. And, and basically, the result of this is there was a sense of excitement in the 1960s. And that's when I was starting to get excited about being a scientist. And I remember talking about science feeding all of the needs, food, energy, health, the needs of the world. In fact, if you look at this wordle, you'll even see science was going to help us with the problems of zombies. So science is the answer. Science was going to provide all of these wonderful answers, which scientists love. It was great. It meant there were resources, there was funding. And we started seeing things like this. Some of you in the audience who have as much or less hair than I do, or gray hair, will remember DuPont's phrase of better living through chemistry. And then, I love this one, this one came from the, Coca from the cola industry, specifically Coca-Cola. And if you can't uh, read it, I'm going to walk over here, so I'll yell. You can see that the rhetoric had gotten a little bit out of hand, and we could spend the whole rest of the night digging up these kinds of things. But this is what scientists were, were starting to do. And you may remember the old story of Ronald Reagan advertising cigarettes as being a healthful uh, uh, additive to your, uh, to your physical regimen. So the public awakens and starts demanding more of this good stuff. They really want this stuff. Two problems come out of that. The first problem is that everything had to pay off. All of a sudden, the concept of working on a problem, because it was an interesting scientific problem, wasn't good enough. Yes, it's an interesting scientific problem, but tell me how it's going to cure cancer, solve the problems of climate change, uh, deal with um, uh, economic crisis. And so we started to get into this mode of demanding a statement of impacts. Now, uh, you heard in the intro, and, and if you look at my bio, I spent a lot of time in my career working for the Office of Naval Research, which had a mission. It was a national security mission. So there had to be something. You had to say, if we're going to invest this, we think it will help the national security uh, mission as follows. Always, the sacred ground among scientists was the National Science Foundation, a curiosity-based, proposal-driven scientific agency where you could go with the best fundamental research idea and never have to worry if it's going to be applied to anything. Well, society couldn't tolerate that. And so society insisted, as a result of what I've described so far, that every proposal to the National Science Foundation had to have a statement of broader 
impacts to society. Now this is significant because the National Science Foundation is the only federal agency that sponsors research that is not mission driven. Think about all the rest of them. National Institutes of Health, my own old agency, NOAA, uh, the US Geological Survey, EPA, they all have a particular mission, not NSF. So this was a rather, in my opinion, insidious move. It represented the culmination of this thinking that, darn it, every piece of research. I'm a taxpayer, I'm paying money for this stuff, I wanna see the payoff for it. My question is, what would this guy have been able to do under that scenario? Now he lived, Einstein lived on the previous scenario I talked about, that scenario of university patronage, if you will. He could do a lot of what he was doing. I'd also argue that Einstein didn't have a whole heck of a lot of overhead associated with his research. A piece of paper and a pencil was just about what all he needed. But the point was, if he had to define what the societal benefit of quantum physics and quantum mechanics would be, he probably never would have been able to do anything he did. So there are people who are trying to address this, and this is another one, a fellow named Norm Augustine. Now, uh, Norm was the Assistant Secretary of the Army. He was also, he's also received the uh, um, National Medal of Technology. He was the uh, CEO of Lockheed Martin. So he was called upon a few years ago to try to set up a concept that would allow us to invest in basic research without necessarily saying this is what the broader impact will be. And there's a wonderful report that he and his group at the National Academies came out with called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. And the, the gathering storm is what I was just talking about. And uh, Augustine and company said 8% of the federal investment in research and development should go to uh, basically high risk but potentially high payoff uh, research which doesn't necessarily have a preconceived broader impact in, built in there. Uh, I had the opportunity to chat with Norm Augustine just two years ago now, and I said to him, sir, 8% seems like a rather specific number. Why did you come up with that? He said, well, half the committee wanted 5%, half the committee wanted 10%. We came up with 7.5%. That sounded too specific, so we rounded up to 8 <laughs> The point is, there should be a dedicated investment in research for research's sake that answers fundamental questions. Now, I want to go back to the problems that I talked about. So the first was that this insistence that everything has to pay off, which can lead us down a, a very narrow road. The second is that, yeah, there were some things that did have payoffs that were not particularly good. Uh, and as a result, science becomes the villain. So the first, many of you may remember the Alar. They called it the Alar scare. It was legitimate. So Alar, for those of you who don't remember this from the 70s, was an additive that was put on fruit, on the fruit stands at Fred Meyer and Giant and all the other supermarkets. And, and this picture shows you what it does. It gives them that wonderful, absolutely shiny gloss. Don't you want to just go buy one of those and chomp down on it? Well, the trouble is it's a carcinogen. So it had to be pulled. And, and here was a case of the, the scientific community thinking, we've done something great. We've added value. Well, not really. You've caused some problems. And then the other, again, many of us in the audience will remember these good old days. This is an actual advertisement that came out. And thank heavens for folks like Rachel Carson and many others who worked on this. And I don't need to tell this audience, but DDT is not good for me. It's not good for anyone. But that was, this does more damage the promise of goodness resulting in damage and hurt. And there are many other examples of this. This is another case. Now, we can have a robust discussion about the value of nuclear energy these days, but this quote from Ronald Reagan reflected the feelings of the times. And, and it's a little bit of a stretch to call this science, but on the other hand, it was predicated on scientific and engineering thinking about what nuclear power really did. And Again, whether it's Chernobyl or Three Mile Island, for a variety of reasons, the scientific promise, the engineering promise, was an over-promise. And the consequence was science walks away, engineering walks away with a, a deserved black eye as a result. Now, the consequence of this, there are several consequences, and I want to talk in the next few slides about what these consequences are. The first is that the scientific community starts losing respect of the rest of the world. This slide comes from a, a, product, a product 
that the National Science Foundation puts out every couple of years called the Science and Engineering Indicators. And if you're a, if you're a data geek, really want to look at how scientific community works, check out the NSF Science and Engineering Indicators. It's got many interesting graphs like this one. What is this graph? This graph reflects the answers uh, or the, the extent to which people agree with the statement that, quote, scientists are odd and peculiar. And they've done this study from going back to 1983, 2001, 2012, 2016. It shows the percentage of people who answered that. And then the color coding is strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or don't know. And if you look at it more carefully, back to over the last 17 years, the number, the percentage of people who agree or strongly agree that scientists are odd and peculiar has doubled. It's gone from 25% to 55% in just those 17 years, 16 years. So that tells you something. It tells you that the scientific community, which had built these ivory towers, may not be living in ivory towers anymore. Interest also starts to wane, and this is a real problem. That we made some promises. We told people, we're going to cure all your ills. We're going to solve all your problems. Uh, I remember in, in the energy world, people talking about uh, nuclear power being so cheap that you won't have an, you'll no longer have an electric bill. Well, people start, when they saw some of these promises not paying off, they started to sh show less and less interest. So this comes from that same publication, the NSF Science and Eng Engineering Indicators. And the question this time was, uh, what is the public interest in selected science-related issues from 1981 to 2016? 1981 here, 2016 over here, percentage of very interested people. And I pulled this uh, chart out because the blue line here that shows a steady decrease from 60% or so down to 40% is environmental pollution. So here's another problem. Interest in the world that we all, you wouldn't be in, in Pilk if you didn't care about environmental issues, and environmental pollution being a specific subset. We are all seeing a waning interest. It's not the people in this audience, it's the ones out on the street, the ones who are not in the crowd here. And a consequence of this is that the government starts turning a blind eye. So we're seeing interest wane, attitudes change, promises not being upheld. In fact, even worse than that, problems being caused by the scientific community. And what you see here now is the budget. R&D as a percentage of the federal budget. There are two lines. One includes uh, the uh, R&D investments for defense. That's the red line. And then the other is the non-defense R&D total budget. This goes back to 1962. The scale here is from 0 to 12 percent. So you can see whether you're talking about including the defense, but more importantly, we should look at this one here. And oh, by the way, this was the buildup to the Vietnam War here, this increase right up here. Uh, and, and since then, that number has gone down, and it's now even statistically significantly below 2 percent. Almost every other developed nation in the world has more than 2% of their GDP invested in R&D. So the federal government is starting to say, well, not sure we want to make this kind of investment. And if you want to look at what's happening now, this is the fiscal year 19 budget. So the federal government just dropped this budget last week. And what it shows you, uh, I, I don't expect you to be able to read all the details, but I do expect you to be able to see that every line here, with the exception of one, is to the left of this vertical. Well, this is the budget request uh, percent change from fiscal year 17. So if numbers to the left, it means the administration, the Trump administration is requesting less money for research than they did in fiscal year 17. And this has all of your favorite agencies, Department of Energy, EPA, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, DOE, USGS, my own old agency, NOAA, all the way down the line. The only one that shows an increase is DOE's NNSA. Uh, National Nuclear Security Administration. This is basically the agency that's responsible for nuclear weapons development. So I decided to look a little bit closer and peel this onion back one more layer. This is my own old agency uh, where I had personal and professional interest in seeing the R&D budget continue to grow, which it had done year after year. And what you're seeing now is similarly the percentage change from the FY17 budget by components of NOAA. So 
Here, for example, is the National Weather Service. All of these components, uh, for the most part, are seeing cuts. This big bar to the left, a 37% cut to the research line office. So with bias, with uh, clear uh, prejudice, there is a cut to the research budget. Probably not a surprise to this audience, but I wanted to show you, no matter how you look at it, as a result of all these things that have been happening, the budget's starting to get cut. There are other things that are happening. Uh, the federal government has a responsibility of providing information and services to the public. You pay taxes so that you can pull up the latest charts of climate change, the latest information with respect to uh, biological diversity in our estuaries. All of that information is out there. So uh, two weeks ago in preparing for this talk, I thought I'd go take a look at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is basically the office of the President's science advisor. And oh, by the way, there isn't one right now. But I went to that office to see what they have currently for plans and preparation for ocean science. It's my own field of study. And when I went to the web and clicked that site, this is what I got. Well, you'll notice on the bottom, I can go look at past administration archives. So the funding is going down, the information is not there. What about advice? So the federal government relies on experts, external experts, through federal advisory committees. These are formally established committees, sometimes legislatively established committees. And what you're seeing here, this uh, chart comes from the Union of Concerned Scientists, is the percentage of science advisory committees that failed to meet as often as their charters directed. So by law, they're supposed to meet three, four, or five times a year. Uh, the percentages here, so, so arguably this number should be zero. They should all be meeting as frequently as they are chartered to meet. And what you're seeing is two things. First of all, they're not zero. In many cases, it's 50, 60, 70 percent of the time. Uh, 70 percent of the, those committees are not meeting as often as they should. And the blue lines are 2016, the yellow lines are 2017, so it's getting worse. This advisory function is not being carried out. One could argue this is a constitutional responsibility of the administration. There's another insidious aspect of this, uh, about this I'm sure you're all familiar with. If you look at what's happening with those federal advisory committees, in this case, it's the EPA, Science Advisory Board. Now, arguably, this should be made of the people who are experts in the things that are part of the EPA mission, understanding biochemistry, understanding chemical engineering. And, and usually, those people come from the academic environment. So back in 2017, almost 80% of that Science Advisory Board was academics. That number now, in 2018, has been reduced to half, and guess where that expertise is now coming from? Industry. That's the yellow slab of this pie. Industry that we could argue does or does not have a vested interest in the particular regulatory activities of that particular agency. So you've got to wonder about not only these committees aren't providing the advice, but when they are providing advice, it may be worse, <laughs> because it may be part and parcel of their own vested interests in a particular field. Staffing is another area. You can get a sense of what's happening with uh, the scientific community by who's being brought in and what they're doing. This chart, very interesting one. Let me explain what's going on here. So along this bottom axis, you have a time scale. Days, number of days from inauguration. So the vertical line is when a particular president was inaugurated. And we have the past six presidents from Trump, Obama, Bush, Clinton, Bush Sr., and Reagan. And when did these presidents appoint their scientific advisors, their scientific leadership? Well, the interesting thing here is Obama actually appointed, uh, it, there should be three up there, because he appointed three scientific advisors. Jane Lubchenco, who, who some of you know from Oregon State University as the head of NOAA, John Holdren as the president's science advisor, and Marsha McNutt, all uh, named, nominated, even before uh, he was inaugurated. You can look at this and figure out what's going on. When you look at the current administration, we are now right about here, the dotted line. If there's an open circle, it means somebody's been nominated but not confirmed. So by this, this administration has appointed and confirmed only two 
scientific leaders. And oh, by the way, this green dot is Francis Collins, the head of the National Institutes of Health. And Dr. Collins has been there for years and years. He's a wonderful guy. In fact, he was the one who was nominated by each of the uh, two previous presidents. So we're not getting the advice. The funding's going down. The scientific leaders in the federal agencies are not being put in place. When you get outside the federal government itself, there are some trends that we're starting to see as a consequence of a lot of what I've talked about here. And if, if you get a chance, this is a wonderful book by a couple of authors from the Rand Corporation, uh, Truth Decay. And they say that there are four things going on, and I'll list them here for you. Uh, the first is that we're going through this interesting stage of disagreeing about facts and interpretations of facts and data. And this is where the scientists are being challenged. This is the classic, if 97% of the climate scientists agree that there is a demonstrable climate change with unequivocal impact by human activities, why do we give equal weight to the 3% who disagree? There's a blurring between the line of opinion and fact. We see that all the time. I would argue much of this is not specific just to the scientific arena. The increasing relative volume and resulting influence of opinion and personal experience over fact. How often do you hear that? Here are the scientific facts. Yeah, well, I saw the following. And then the last is the declining trust in formally respected sources of factual information, which I showed you graphically earlier on that somewhat humorous slide about uh, scientists being weird and peculiar. So there's this erosion of the ethos of science. Peer review is being questioned. I testified on the Hill a few years ago and was accused of using peer review, which they felt was just a, uh, a mechanism, a cronyism tool that it was a way of getting my buddies to sign on to the work that I was supporting. So this whole ethos is changing. And we're starting to see things like this. This is a uh, memo that came out of the leadership of the Department of Interior. Grants and cooperative agreements must be reviewed by the senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Policy, Management, and Budget. That's a political appointee whose expertise is policy. We'll now review that scientific award. This is USGS primarily. That scientific award that says, um, we are going to study seismology in the Cascades and we're going to use the following techniques. Now it has to be reviewed by a policy lead. That's a very, very scary kind of concept. So all of these things are starting to come together. And in fact, there was a wonderful op-ed by Maria Zuber, who's the vice president for research at a, a small institution back on the East Coast called the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and uh, Maria wrote, among other things, that other nations seeing us lose focus are seizing the chance to rise. So we are, I, I've laid a groundwork here. I'm sure I've cheered you all up with all of this. Stick with me. We're going to have a little bit of fun now, and then I do have some hopeful comments to, to bring. <laughs> I hope so, right? I want to talk about one of the other manifestations that we see. So it's not all just this inside the beltway stuff with budgets and staff. There's stuff happening out there, and one that really ticks me off is the surge in pseudoscience. You've all seen it. Now, this is a classic, almost iconic image from 1905 of the science of phrenology. Some of you may remember that. And the idea in phrenology was that the form and the shape of the head determine character. Now, whether you believe that or not, it was easily disproved. But it's kind of funny. When I looked at this, I thought, I, I think I know some of those people. <laughs> and I looked at this real carefully. And the guy on the left, is supposed to be an observer, but not a thinker. And boy, he looks an awful lot like Warren Harding to me, <laughs> who was clearly an observer and not a thinker. And then when I thought, well, are there any thinkers out of there that are just out of touch? Uh, they're not really an observer. I thought, holy smokes, that looks like Karl Rove. <laughs> and then I realized the theory really kind of goes to hell in a handbasket, because the guy on the right who's supposed to be an observer and a thinker looks an awful lot like Rob Porter. And we all know he is neither one of those. So pseudoscience is taking a lot of forms. The other one I love is the Flat Earth Society. But of course, we all know that if the Earth was flat, cats would have pushed everything off of it by now. <laughs> the other one, intelligent design. Um, I have no problem with people believing that. I do have a problem with people presenting that as a scientific school of thought. My counter argument is that. Really, is that intelligent design? Or if you don't buy that, what about the Darwin Awards like this one? <laughs> Clearly, intelligent design is not part of that. The other part of pseudoscience, which you will see everywhere, and for the law students in the room, pay close attention to these next two slides, because I guarantee you, in your career, you will be faced with the dilemma of whether correlation 
is causation. What do I mean by that? Correlation basically being that if you plot one seemingly independent variable against another and they show a relationship that is predictable, there must be dependence on those. So a good example would be the occurrence of lung cancer versus the uh, years of smoking that somebody underwent. And there is a correlation there. But people tend to abuse that. And they say that if there is a correlation, there must be causation, which is not true. And this is two examples. The first is on the lower axis from the Department of Agriculture, the metric tons of fresh lemons imported to the United States from Mexico. And on the y-axis from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the total US highway fatality rate with an R squared, a correlation coefficient, the measure of how well these are correlated, of almost one. One is perfect. So what this concludes is that if we were to import more lemons from Mexico, we would tr finally drive that accident rate on the highways to zero. Okay? Here's my favorite as, a, as an environmental scientist and climate scientist. The number of pirates versus the global average temperature. Now in this case, as you would hope, it's a negative correlation. That is to say, the numbers go from 35,000 pirates in 1820 to 17 in, I can't read that, 2000, I guess. And in fact, yes, the global average temperature has gone from 14 degrees C, a little over 14, to almost 16. So the answer there, of course, is we need more pirates, and we'll solve the climate change uh, problem. So be careful of this, and there's a lot of this going on. You see it all the time. We're seeing it so much right now in the debate with respect to gun policy. People find their favorite statistic, draw some conclusions, and say, if this, then that. Be careful of that. What does this tell you? It's wrong on so many levels. I love that reaction. Okay. So let's talk about the way forward. The way forward, it starts with citizen scientists. Citizen scientists helping the scientific community. So the concept of citizen science is one that we see in any number of different uh, venues. And, and this slide calls out some very reputable groups, Zooniverse, uh, citizenscientists.gov, SciStarter. Uh, citizenscience.org. You may know this uh, through some of the examples we've seen over the years. The National Weather Service, for example, uses a cooperative observer program. If you've got a credible weather station at your home that you've put up, you can actually send those weather data to the National Weather Service. Years ago, NASA said, gee, all these uh, desktop computers that are sitting idle all night, we could actually use them for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence by having them process all the data we've got, that's a citizen science activity. The one I love was, and it's really more of a crowdsourcing, but the National Institutes of Health, working with Google, realized they could get a much better lead time on forecasting where there were going to be outbreaks of influenza, not by using sophisticated public health models, but by looking at the Google search demographics for words like fever or uh, stomach ache, and what they found was parents usually are the best indicator, and they know when their kids are having a problem, and you'd start to see these clusters of Google searches showing up somewhere, and sure enough, a week later, the, the hospitals and clinics were inundated with folks, folks suffering from influenza. So these are sort of citizen science outreach kinds of things. I'd also like to point out that um, there's another way of moving forward, and, and this starts to get to the hopefulness that I want to uh, close out the talk with in a few minutes. So we've gone from citizen scientists helping the scientific community, here I can get you some data, to citizen scientists leading the scientific community. And we've seen a number of examples of this. And I'm going to ask Evan back here to click on that uh, web link. It's a YouTube link. Uh, show of hands, how many of you watched the, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy recovery? Great, most of you did not. Uh, Evan, can we turn the volume down a little bit on that? Thank you. Maybe a little more. Okay, so this is the work of Elon Musk, the founder of PayPal, the founder of Tesla. Uh, Elon Musk, with some federal funding, but mostly his own money, basically said, um, I can start putting rockets in space. This is the largest 
vehicle ever put in space. Elon Musk has a sense of humor, so what did he put into space? He put a Tesla into space with Rocket Man, a dummy sitting in the driver's seat. But what he did that was remarkable is he said the rocket boosters that launch this thing should be recoverable. And he developed this technology. Now what you're going to see here in a few minutes, uh, I'd ask you to pay attention to the uh, upper left panel, uh, which eventually will show you these rocket boosters. These are multi tens of millions of dollars of uh, worth of hardware that NASA would typically throw away, let it land in the ocean and just build another one. And Elon Musk said, I think we've got the science and technology to be able to recover these. The images on the lower left and lower right are the, basically the GoPro cameras on those rocket boosters looking down at Earth. So they are looking at their landing zone. And if you now watch in the upper left, you will see those boosters landing. Isn't that phenomenal? Thank you, Evan. Can you go back to the PowerPoint? So the point there was Elon Musk, Musk is a private citizen who has now challenged the scientific community. And not just in this. The, the whole concept behind Tesla, I would argue from an economics perspective, the whole concept behind PayPal, these are challenges. So this is where the citizen scientist is leading the community. It's a little bit like what we had in the 19th century, isn't it? The other two, anybody recognize this guy? James Cameron of Titanic fame. Uh, but he also said, you know, I don't understand why the scientific community has not succeeded in building a vehicle that will allow us to go 11,000 meters down to the bottom of the ocean uh, as we did 50 years ago. Nobody had ever been there since then. And so he took it upon himself to develop this manned vehicle and went down to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it, it, it's phenomenal. I mean, NASA, NOAA spend millions and millions of dollars trying to do that. He has now revolutionized the science and technology associated with manned uh, underwater vehicles. Uh, the folks on the right, of course, are Bill and Melinda Gates. Now, this is a little bit of a stretch in terms of the citizen scientists, but, but what it is, is in their case, uh, Bill Gates obviously uh, made his fortune in the information technology world and computer uh, world, and now he and Melinda Gates are trying to stimulate development in the biomedical and public health world. So these kind, and I could have put others there, Eric Schmidt from Google, Paul Allen, many other folks are doing these kinds of things. There is hope. These people, many of them, who could be spending their their billions of personal wealth on, on buying gold toilets instead are doing this kind of thing. So I would argue we're moving from the citizen scientists helping the scientific community to the scientists, citizen scientists leading the scientific community to a new era. And the new era is citizens as scientists in society. So break down the ivory towers, recognize that we as citizens have a responsibility. So not only do we need to, if you will, get out more, we need to engage the broader community, which is exactly why when Parker first called me, uh, I said, I would love to talk with this group because I think this is the concept. We can no longer think of society as broken up into bits and pieces. Lawyers here, financial planners there, scientists there. And I call to, as I've done throughout this talk, I've, I call to your attention several individuals who are doing exactly that. In one class, they are people who were trained to do things fundamentally differently who decided, I've got to get involved. So this is Brian Baird. Brian Baird was a congressman, was a congressman from Washington State's third district in the Federal House of Representatives. Uh, he was trained as a clinical psychologist. He ended up being the Washington, the congressperson who advocated so strongly for policy to deal with ocean acidification. I never in my wildest dreams would have guessed that a clinical psychologist from Washington State would be the person leading the call for measuring uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the ocean, measuring the pH of ocean, and dealing with ocean acidification. 
The other member of Congress is this fellow, a physicist from Princeton named Rush Holt. He also is no longer in Congress. He represented New Jersey's 12th district, which, oh, by the way, includes a small campus called Princeton University, where he was a professor. He is the one who advocated for so much of the uh, global, what we used to call the global change research agenda back in the uh, uh, early 2000s. Uh, and trained as a physicist, he recognized he could do more for the community acting as a voice for science in Congress than he could do for the plasma physics community as a professor at Princeton. So these are people who said, I'm going to start working in my capacity to represent the public. The two women on the lower right are, are personal friends of mine. Some of you may know Jane Lubchenco. Jane is a marine ecologist at Oregon State University who was called by President Obama to run the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Jane is passionate about ecosystem-based management of our nation's commercial fisheries. She said, I can, do, I can write papers, I continue to do, do studies and, and, and mentor my students. I can also go to Washington and take a lead in the federal agency. Similarly, Marsha McNutt, a geophysicist who used to be the head of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, took on the, the veil of running the U.S. Geological Survey, and now is the president, first woman president of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics, and Medicine. These two women decided to engage in a very different way. The third one is a very different individual. This old guy up here, uh, who is now the ripe old age of 21, is a young Dutch fellow named Boyan Slot, who determined that the ocean plastics pollution problem needed a very different way of thinking. And I remember when he came and visited me at NOAA, and he walked in, and he was two years younger than he is in that picture, and he said, I have a solution for this problem. And, and my first reaction is, we've been working on this for years and pouring tens of millions of dollars. And he told me what his solution was. And I gave him some uh, advice as to who he could talk to in Washington. Long story short, he basically got a lot of doors slammed in his face. So he went back to the Netherlands, got uh, the Dutch government to uh, support him to the tune of $50 million. Long story short, if you Google the ocean cleanup now, you'll see an organization of some 70 or 80 professionals who are putting a half-scale prototype ocean cleanup device off the coast of California this spring. Um, I'm on their board. That's a paid political announcement. I was so convinced that this young guy had the fire in his belly and the passion. He had no formal training. He wasn't a physicist. He, he got a sort of traditional Dutch uh, higher, uh, 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 high school education, but he took it upon himself to say, I'm going to be engaged, I'm going to lead the community, and I'm also going to be part of the community. So how does this materialize? How does this manifest itself? Citizens, scientists in society, and society working with, science, with, with scientists. I would argue that beyond being an observer, which is what the classic citizen scientist is, we've seen that scientists can now be advisors. And to be the advisor, they have to be part of the ecosystem of innovation that is science. And as a test of this concept, I decided I would try something interesting. I, I like The Economist. I find it a very thoughtful journal. I get it every week. So to convince you that I didn't cherry pick this, this is this week's cover of The Economist. And I looked at that and I thought, all right, if this works, if this concept that I've talked about up here, engagement by the scientific community with society, and vice versa. I ought to be take, able to take all the top issues that are in this and parlay them into how they depend on scientific knowledge and how scientists should be engaging in these. And guess what, folks? Here you go. The first one is called, the first story they have is the right way to do Brexit. You can't do that without economics. Economics is a science. It's a social science. The second, uh, who Cyril Ramaphosa should fire. Cyril Ramaphosa is the new president of South Africa. And if you weren't aware, Cape Town is about to run out of water. Seems to me the hydrologists need to be part of this dialogue and should have been part of this dialogue long ago. The next one, lead paint, still a poisonous problem. That goes without saying. It's a chemistry, physiology, many other scientific issues. 
South Korea's fetish for fortune telling. And that's exactly what this story is. It's a story about folks in South Korea obviously enamored with using fortune tellers. And, and I would argue this is, gets to the pseudoscience, but maybe a little bit of education on probability and statistics would help with some of the consideration of what fortune tellers can or can't do. And then, of course, the cover story, the meddler, uh, Putin and what he's been doing, and obviously information technology and the sciences, the computer sciences, are a critical component of that particular policy discussion. If I've been successful in this discussion over the last 45 minutes or so, I've shown you what the path has been that we've gone down as scientists with respect to the loss of resources, the loss of connectivity, the loss of respect, the loss of value. The value principle has, has eroded considerably for the scientific community, but the way forward, and the way forward is founded on the concept of what citizen science is and what citizen scientists can do. So I will close by going back to that op-ed from Maria Zuber at MIT and point out that she wrote that to write the next great chapter in the story of our nation, we must continue to fuel discovery. And that discovery is based on the robust ecosystem of innovation. So help us get there, and I look forward to seeing us move in that direction in the decades to come. Thank you very much.